It was it was a nightmare, but I was still playing well. I mean, and it was just there was a lot of pain and so forth, you know. And I, without going any further into it, I finally I just quit playing for ten months. I was just going through a complete life scene, you know. Who am I? What am I doing? Why do I do this? You know. What do I really want to do with my life? If they're playing and it hurts, don't play. Take take some time off. I, I want people to know that there's two things you can do with music: you can impress people or touch people. Think about what your intention is. Welcome to Trust the Process. My name is Clark Lovell. I'm your host, and this is our first episode of this podcast. And for our first episode, I knew that I needed to get somebody who is not only an aficionado in, in injury recovery, but also is the go-to guy. Some people might even call him the go-to guru of uh, of injury recovery, especially for trumpet players. He is one of the most recorded on you know gone on tours. Uh, musicians, um, trumpet players that we have seen in, in our day. So without further ado, Mr. Bobby Shu, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for the kind words. <laughs> the go-to guru, that's funny. Man. Yeah, that's a that's a hat tip to uh, Jose Johnson over at the Trumpet Gurus Hang oh, podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, he's thanks to him for cool he's he I credit him with a lot of uh the genesis of this show, actually. Um probably have him on the show later. Um, so just to start out, um, I wanted to get uh, your kind of your story of your injury. Um, my, my One of my mentors, my big band director here at Brigham Young University, Ray Smith, told me a story of when you were in the Buddy Rich big band. And uh, I won't tell any of the story. I'll let, let that go to you. Um, well, OK, first of all, I, I, I want to preface that story by telling you that I had no teacher as a kid, so I didn't uh, had any guidance about how to play correctly and i made a lot of uh you know i guess you could say less than adequate i don't like to use the word stupid because it has a different meaning but i think i've made a lot of decisions about how to put the mouthpiece up there and how to play and breathe and do this and warm up and practice and everything else and and a lot of it was it was okay i was very gifted and uh, i did fine except that I had problems uh, when I was in senior in high school. I had a cyst on my lip that had to have radiation treatments to burn out, and it caused a little bit of a numb spot on my lip on the orbicular muscle right at the top, just a little off to the left. And so I had to go in a few times a week and put a lead sheet on me, and they zapped me for I don't remember how many minutes. It wasn't long. It was three or four or five minutes or something with this tube right up against my lip, you know, zapping me, you know, radiation or something. I, I had no idea. But they they burned the, the cyst out of my lip, created a numb spot on my lip. So I kept playing with this numb spot. It never bothered me that much. But when I got into Buddy Rich's band, uh, to, it was the first time I was ever thrown into being the lead player. I had played some lead parts here and there in the military and this and that. But I was mostly a jazz player and so forth and whatever. But um, on Buddy Rich's band, we we recorded West Side Story playing at two, four nights in a club. Two, we played three sets a night and we ended the first and third set with West Side Story, which is a, it's a gargantuan effort, you know. And uh, so we never got a good recording of it because the trombone player kept missing stuff in, in his solo. So we went in on Monday, the following Monday after the four nights in a club and did basically 21 starts on West Side Story, not complete takes, but I had to keep playing it and playing it and playing it and playing it. And my breathing was not good in those days, not the yoga breath that I now teach and so forth. 
And and so I was using a lot of pressure and screwing the mouthpiece up into my lip and pressing like crazy, and it cut my lip open. It got a blood blister on there, and then it eventually broke open. Blood squirted out, all this and that. I couldn't play for quite a while, for a couple of weeks. I was sending subs in when we got to New York. I was sending all kinds of top players in New York into sub for me on Buddy's Band. And I was trying, Maynard Ferguson gave me some some kind of cream. I don't remember what it was. It was some med- high medication he used to use. And he had a little bit of a bottle of it left. He gave me that. So I put that on my lip. And it started to come around and all that. But still, I went on The Tonight Show to play West Side Story with Buddy's Band. Uh, and I split it open again on the show. And... Uh, it was it was a nightmare, but I was still playing well. I mean, and it was just there was a lot of pain and so forth, you know. And I, without going any further into it, I finally I just quit playing for ten months. At one point, I I didn't know if I was going to be able to continue, but I wanted to play, and I got I ran out of money. I had to get back playing again, so I went. Uh, I started up, and I started having problems again, but. Uh, I managed to have not as much, no cutting at this time. And I had learned a few things, but um, the secret for me was when I learned the yoga breath from Bud Risboy, you know, and once I started to breathe from the abdominal area, rather than playing from the whole facial area, which so many players do, you know, and this is one of the things that leads to a great many of the, of the, the kinds of injuries that are, just from using excess pressure and all that stuff and wrong mouthpieces and things of that sort, you know, but yeah. uh, those kind of things are common. And once I made the corrections and since then, I've never really had any problems with my chops. And, and I made the correction like 50 years ago, basically, you know? And so I've had the last 50 years of ease of playing, you know, because I learned, how to do it. And so a lot of the people that I handle in, in injuries, the majority of them are people who have played uh, incorrectly. But they don't breathe properly from the abdominal area. They play on a mouthpiece that does has negative effects, forces them to pinch to compensate for energy loss in the mouthpiece, mm-hmm. things of that sort. And uh, they try to play lead trumpet on a 7C mouthpiece, how are you going to do it? It's like, I, I always say it's like hitting, trying to hit a home run with a cucumber or a banana. You're not going to succeed with that. You know, you mm-hmm. have to get a bat, so to speak. Right. And, right. Uh, but there's a lot of false data that's passed around and it ends up injuring an awful lot of people. And, and because I've studied so much of the science of anatomy, physiology, and, and, you know, working with, I'm in my 50th year of working with Yamaha, designing instruments oh, and stuff. Yeah. I have to know something about, I have to know something about physics of instruments and acoustics and stuff. And so I make it my primary objective in life now to uh, continually read excessively as, as many books as I can get on neuroscience, neuro, neuroplasticity, things like that that help the brain and the the being that owns that brain uh, mm-hmm. overcome problems, but you have you know if you if you have a nerve or a muscle breakdown or a combination of the two of them failing to function together, you can't just guess and light candles. It doesn't make it go away. You have to know something about science, and physiology. So that helps. I mean, I've had a lot of people. Uh, 36 people so far with Bell's palsy have come to me. Uh, And that is, you would think that's serious, but there, I found out there's ways to speed up the process of recovery on that. And by by isometrics and stuff like that and breathing and whatever. Go ahead. What were you going to ask? Well, uh, something that we were talking about before, um, you kind of mentioned, uh, I think this would be good for for my audience to hear just for, for information, right? To be learning about it is um, you learned, I think you told me you learned through those 36 uh, people that came to you, um, you have a hypothesis that's pretty well studied oh. of uh, what causes Bell's palsy, just kind of a little. Aaron, 
the air in the ear. Yeah, that was yeah. so interesting to me because I, I never would have thought that anything going through your ear would affect anything in your face, you know, and most people wouldn't well, think that, you know. Well, there are numerous cranial nerves in the, in the, in the brain and so forth. They come down into the, you know, nerves feed into the body and help tell, tell the body, train the body how to function. Muscles don't know how to do anything unless they're given information. And that's where the brain comes in is because right. when we learn to, to buzz or flutter or, or do some exercise, uh, whatever, it becomes a neuro, neuromuscular pattern in the brain. And those, those neurons in the brain send tentacle like things. There's three tentacles that, uh, Dendrite neuron and axon, and uh, why did I forget the third one? A synapse, of course. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Th those things all interconnect to muscles, and they have information in them, and it shows the muscle. Well, sometimes the muscle is taught to do the wrong thing, and a guy can do the thing habitually over right. and over and over again because he's been lied to, not intentionally, but. Mm -hmm. Like the, most of the teachers um, that I've run into, including a lot of them with ITG and all of that, don't don't have a clue about the physiology of the body. They mm -hmm. they don't even they think that there's muscle in the lips, which there's not. You know, they don't know what a diaphragm is or where it is or why why it's there even. You know, but the point about it is that people don't. I don't think that the teachers are have evil intentions. I just think. They've been misled too, and so it's it's a, a it's like like father like son, so to speak. You know, I mean, it could right. goes from one generation to the next, and we don't know how far back this goes. Hundreds of years, perhaps. You mm -hmm. know, and blacksmith blacksmith would finish shooing a horse and then make you a mouthpiece, maybe. Right. I mean, you know. Right. So you know, I mean, it's there's a lot of long history of problems with all this, and I'm not. <clears throat> My only f feeling of negativity toward the teachers is, is that now in this day and age, it's easy enough to learn the truth about things like that. You don't have to buy into everything that people tell you, you know, <clears throat> and not enough people read. That's for one thing, you know, they, mm -hmm. <laughs> they can Google something and get something. But social media is full of lies all day long, you know, and uh, Right. I just think people uh, teach people who are going to teach have the responsibility. It's it's the behooves them to study a little bit deeper. There's a book written uh, called Trumpet Science, and oh, cool. it was written by a, uh, a guy that was in the military, I think, in an Air Force band, uh, and uh, he's retired, lives up in Wisconsin, and that book is available on Amazon for like thirty bucks or thirty five dollars or something. And it's pretty good. It's not perfect. Nothing's perfect. But he's 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 done a tremendous amount of research as far as muscles and breathing and mouthpieces and equipment and how it works and vibrations and the whole thing. So, it, you know, for 30 or $40 or something, that book can answer an awful lot of questions for for people who are learning to play. And every teacher should have it. <laughs> I think they have the obligation to have it, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's, they should, and I think every trumpet player can get a copy of it too, you know. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> anyway, the, the whole thing about severe problems, you know, other than just a banged up lip or tired corners or things right. like that, like when you get into Bell's palsy, uh, that's like a, a – it's related to a, a stroke because of it's a mm -hmm. similar kind of thing. When the seventh cranial nerve in the left side of your face comes down, it collapses everything and, and it fails. The whole left side of your face goes like numb on you, you know, and right. you can't get anything to tighten up over here and your eyelid droops on you. You can't get anything. You can't even speak. You try to eat soup, it'll end up on your left <laughs> side of your shirt, you know. And, nice. and so uh, and Bell's palsy is a, is a rugged one, but my – take on that is the 36 people that have come to me over the years not all, all 36 of them because some of them in the early stages i had no clue and i just helped them mostly by doing a, a facial recovery thing with a hot moist washcloth 
right. and a lot of fluttering for blood supply and a lot of isometric buzzing, like, you know, doing <laughs> but where the left side of the face is weak, I would have them cover that with a finger and <laughs> to, to simulate that, right? Create an external tension that teaches the muscle, oh, this is what you want me to do. <laughs> so it's right. okay. doing that. But anyway, the majority of the, the cases that I've had of that, probably of 36 people, I would say at least 25 of them or so have. And I, I would ask them, like, when did it start? What was occurring? And in and, and at least 20 to 25 of those cases, it had something to do with rolling a window down and cold air coming into their ear after they had played. And their the nerves in, out toward the eardrum are excessively, they're hyper activated from all the internal compression that you build up right, yeah. as, a power, that as a power lead, as a lead player, especially, you know, so you're sitting there and if you're playing with a small aperture and the air is not getting out here, it's going to find somewhere and it'll go into the sinuses. It'll go into your nose, pharynx, and it'll go out here. If it goes out to the eardrum and, and that the eardrum is like hypersensitive and then you roll down a window to get some air to stay awake on the drive home. And that old cold air goes in, hits that hypersensitive, those nerves that are right at the edge of the air drum. It's like putting a match to a worm. It fires back and it goes right to the brain and bang. Seventh cranial nerve goes down. There you go. And so it's either been rolling a window down in a car, uh, turning on a fan, an air conditioner in a room, sleeping next to an air conditioner or being in a hot room and putting a little fan on the nightstand and blowing air at you while you're in bed and it, it goes right into your ear. So like, oh my God, you know. And mm -hmm. even in Doc Severinsen's case, he played a concert in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1992, uh, played hard as he always does and decided rather than get in the car, he walked four blocks or so to his hotel. And uh, when he got to bed, he told me he went to bed and and then after a little while in bed, uh, it was it just barely falling asleep. And then he got a, a sharp, like a ice pick needle, like sh shot in his left ear. And like somebody had stuck a pin in his eardrum and it just went and his whole face exploded on him. And he had Bell's Farsley like that, you know. And so d this uh, this common denominator of cold air started to get me to a point and I've talked to some doctors about it and they went, nah, 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 you know, but you know, there's something about common denominators that says I'm, I'm, I think I'm onto the right path with this because a lot of the doctors I've talked to, and even if you go online and, and Google and type it in all this and get all the articles you want to read, nobody knows what causes Bell's palsy. That's, that's you know? what I've heard up until this point, and that's why I wanted to bring it up on this show, even though it didn't necessarily have much to do with your body rich experience, but it's just that's that's information you don't hear unless someone has dealt with it so much like like you have. Um, well, I'm always interested in what's the source. I want to know. Of course, yeah. What's the source of these things? And so if you can understand the source that knows tells you where to attack, you know, if a guy's got, he says, you know, I hurt. Well, where? Be more specific, you know. Well, you know, is it everywhere? <laughs> well, if it's everywhere, it's probably a severe case of neuropathy of some sort, mm -hmm. you know, but you know, but if it, if he can say, "Oh, in my my left foot." Well, if you look in his shoe and find that there's a goat head sticker in his in his sock, well, <laughs> then you can solve the problem, you know. I mean, you, you know what I'm saying? It's like Pain has a, a reason. Some of it's emotional and some of it's physical. And so, uh, you know, sometimes a person who has emotional levels, mentally things like severe left brain domination in the way they approach the trumpet or something like that, they got to win, they got to be first chair, they got to you know, compete in all times. And they always play excessively. They pinch, press, and pray, and they and they'll do anything to get that horrible sounding double C out of there, you know. <laughs> and uh, and you see these injuries. A lot of them are are just like stupid, you know. They come they mm -hmm. come around because 
Well, and, and the poor kids that are doing it, you know, it's, yeah, this system of ours creates too much competition and right and wrong issues about missing notes and stuff. And that's right. a source of a, a lot of the ego issues that, that occur that cause a lot of the injuries, you know. But, you know, that there are things that, the, back to the thing on Bell's palsy, there's three things that are severe ne neurological things. Bell's palsy is one. Focal dystonia is another one. Right. That's where, that's a nerve, uh, uh, also a nerve uh, issue. It's a collapsing nerve. And it's quite often caused by extreme pressure and stress in the in the face with the person playing incorrectly. And then the third one is called tetany, T-E-T-A-N-Y. Mm -hmm. And that's that's so severe, it's unbelievable. And I've had two people have had tetany. Uh, one of them was the former lead trumpet player in the uh, the Falcon Airs, the Airmen, the Air Force Band up in Colorado Springs at the Academy. And the other is a son of uh, the principal trumpet player of the Prague Philharmonic in, in the Czech Republic. And, uh, and the tetany is, it, it, it does something to the nerve that when you pull, you're sitting fine and you pull the horn up and as you get up here, it, it starts, your whole head and everything starts to shake and you can't even get the thing on your chops, you know? And in both cases, all I've been able to do with that is get people to to make sure they're breathing properly, to do some facial exercises and recovery stuff with the moist, hot washcloth and things like that. And then sometimes they have to sit down and I say, get a notebook and write about your playing, you know, self-analysis. Just write. Write, write how you play. What do you want to play? Why do you play? You know, and get things off of your chest because sometimes the mind being senior to the body can really inf influence the way the body functions. Neuromuscular things, they get uptight. You know, there's a tension mm -hmm. goes, I got to be first chair, you know, or everybody's look, they're not, they're not clapping loud enough for me or something like that. You know, this is, this is like Couch Canyon stuff. I mean, this is where a guy needs a shrink more than he needs a, a rub down, you know, so to speak. You know? <laughs> But, the, you know, the, the, the whole process of, of like, if it's not a mental thing, if it's just something physical, then it's easier to solve because there, there are foundation things like blood in the face, isometric toning of the facial muscles, aperture opening, playing on a sensible mouthpiece, and playing for the right reason, not competitively, you know, mm -hmm. playing musically. And then all of a sudden things start to work and by troubleshooting that way it's very easy to fix problems you know and so uh i mean i i think my lucky star is that i got forced into science on this whole thing because yeah. it's it's given me it makes me look smart and i'm not really that smart you know <laughs> well, well i think well, hundreds of us would, would disagree but um i wanted to kind of go back um to kind of that, that you said that 10 month break um that you said you took after buddies i'm just curious um when you were in that space right in that recovery space is that one kind of like your your um deep dive into the science and the physiology uh, like was it kind of out of necessity that you started studying that kind of stuff and then people Not started there. coming to you or or how did how did that all start when people started coming to you after your injury well <clears throat> Nothing started then. I was not sure I was ever going to play the trumpet again during that 10 months period. I didn't listen to music. I didn't play the trumpet. I didn't even have one near me, not a mouthpiece or anything. Uh, and I stayed completely. I was just going through a complete life scene. You know, who am I? What am I doing? Why do I do this? You know, what do I really want to do with my life? You know, I studied a little bit of to be in architecture in college, but mm -hmm. I, I studied that a little because I was interested in, in architecture. <clears throat> and uh, and I had some friends that were architects and it was inspiring. And I loved Frank Lloyd Wright and Mies van der Rohe and all these great architects, you know, but the, I had this passion about the trumpet, but the pain that I went through so much took that passion away. It, not entirely, but, 
it, it frustrated me, so I stayed away. And I had to think myself through this whole th process. And when I came back on, I was just being careful. And I was sitting, I, there was another trumpet player in Las Vegas I was sitting next to doing, uh, I can't remember who we were doing, Frank Sinatra or somebody like that. And, and <clears throat> this other trumpet player was one of these guys who thought he knew all the answers, you know, but he kept, hmm. he kept telling me, you know, giving me suggestions and things, but at least he was trying to help me, you know? And, uh, and he was saying a lot of screwball things and I, I wasn't gullible enough to believe everything he told me, but I knew I had to start paying very close attention to what I was doing and not being excessive, backing off a little bit, not, you know, trying to be the loudest guy on the planet or something like that, you know, and, and sometimes you can get misled by some bands I played on me, you know, come on, we're not hearing the trumpets, you know, I'm going crying out loud. If you wouldn't play the drums so loud, maybe you could hear us, you know, I mean, maybe, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know what I'm saying? Or I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, you know, and, but every um, band trumpet player would agree with you. But during the 10 months, I was soul searching really more than anything. I wasn't working on my chops at all. When I came back, I had to start thinking about it. And it was all tied in with, you know, right after I came back on the horn a little bit, I decided to move to L.A. And then right off the bat, I started getting sessions in the studio, which was a heck of a lot easier on the trumpet chops to sit and do a movie or jingles or a television show where you don't play anything except the opening theme and some four to five, six, seven second bumpers between scene changes. Sure. You know, you, when you're doing stuff like television, you hardly ever play anything. You know, you can, you can sit for 300 measures of a violin solo and then come in and play a chord, you know? And so <laughs> and sometimes in those cases, when working like that, you have to, fulfill what you're not getting challenged to do uh, in the studios. So you have to go home and make sure that, well, I didn't play any high notes today, so I'm going to go home and practice some just to make sure they're still there or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. But the main thing was that when Bud, when Maynard Ferguson in 70, 1974 gave me the Yogi, uh, uh, the Science of Breath by Yogi Ramacharaka, uh, who was a, a guy, I forget his name, he was a he was a Caucasian guy in Chicago. He wasn't really Yogi Ramachanaka. He just made that name up to sell the book, I think, you know. But Ray Maynard gave me a copy of that book, and Bud Brisboy showed me how to use the breath. It changed my playing drastically. I've never had a problem since then. And a lot of it really stems from, like, being uh, in control of your airstream and developing the muscles that can handle it up in your face area and understanding that an aperture has to be open and things mm -hmm. like that. And, and so if you put all those pieces together, it's quite simple. All of the playing is going to be easy. And so people who come to me for injuries and things like that, I don't really know where, where it started, but I mean, I mean, people like Roger Ingram, when he was 14, he started studying with me. And all he wanted to do was play high notes, you know? And so he was beating himself up and, and, you know, not always doing the right thing, you know, chemically, so to speak, you know. And uh, so he had problems. And so I just kept trying to, I showed, he was one of the first guys I showed the yoga breath to. And uh, it took him five years to learn to do this thing correctly because he was like doing other, his head was in another place, you know. But <clears throat> he finally got it. And then I guess the word got around. I was helping some other kids and the word got around and other people come, started coming to me. And when I was in LA doing studio work, I had a list of people waiting to get lessons with me. And they would say, when can I get in? I'd say, it's gonna probably take about nine or 10 months before you can I can get you in. And they'd go, what? Wow. And sometimes I would, the guy would leave his name and number and I'd call back. And he'd already stopped, sold the horn, and quit playing. And I went, oh, I'm sorry. But I was so busy, I couldn't teach all day long. There's no money for, for $20 an hour, you know? Are you kidding? Right, you know? right. 
That's what I was charging. When I gave lessons to Roger Ingram, it was $5 for an hour. and But it was for two guys, and they each paid $2.50. And sometimes <laughs> the, lessons, the lessons would go two and a half or three hours and for five bucks, you know. There's no, there's no money in teaching. I mean, even to this day, I don't charge enough right. to make it worthwhile. But, you know, the thing about it is that I there are too many kids and parents, families that don't have a whole lot of money. And uh, so <clears throat> I don't I, – I have to charge something because it doesn't look good if you don't charge anything because – Well, it's the value you, exchange, right? Well, it's a thing called exchange, and if you, mm-hmm. you know, if you give me ten apples, and I'll give you ten bananas, you know, and mm-hmm. I'm like that. But and sometimes people, if they don't pay for anything, they figure it has no value, you know, or they don't pay attention, you know, <laughs> they don't yeah, pay, right. they don't pay attention. <laughs> but anyway, the thing about it is that um, it just started getting ridiculous, you know. People, I was doing a lot of clinics, and people, I would talk about things at clinics, and it, the word got out, and people said. I'm going to get lessons with Bobby, you know, whether it was for injuries or just lessons, you know, but the injuries started <laughs> coming in more and more, you know, and now and sometimes I see that one of the only reasons that people contact me is they're in trouble. You know, they don't come to me when they're playing well or feeling good, you know. And why, why do you think that is like, because I've heard from other people, um, uh, some people that have helped me through my injury, uh, their own theories of like, they, they, you know, apparently more and more injuries are coming in. And I know you've got some thoughts about that, but like, why do you think, I guess the number of injuries in young musicians is, is going up rather than going down? Well, I think the challenges are being thrown at them. Competitions like at schools that have big band competitions and stuff like sure. that, they're threatened by their band director to get, get their poop together, so to speak, you know, and, <laughs> And, uh, you know, and they get and they thrash them about in rehearsals and get them ready to go up there and compete. And all they want to do is win a plastic trophy to hang in, on the wall or put up on a shelf in the band room. And, and to, to thrash the futures and the lives of kids over a stupid plastic trophy is, to me, insane. Competition is, yeah, as, yeah what, what is it that uh, it's been said that competition is for horses, not for artists? You know, and that's all right. That's I, can see that. <laughs> I saw a show. I saw it as an aside. I saw a thing on television a couple of days ago. It was a, a show on PBS about uh, the industry of horse racing, and they're starting to have some thoughts about all of this because horses are dying because they're putting them on drugs. <laughs> they're injecting them with all kinds of things to try to win races. And they're killing horses. They're dying like left and right. Yikes. And this is criminal. And it's all about greed and money and stuff like that. And people that will, that, that have to win, they have to win. This is the same guy that will buy a gun, I swear to you. And, and that's like, uh, it's criminal. It's unbelievable that what we go through in this society. I mean, yeah. we're, we're not, you would think that we wouldn't be as stupid as we are, but the society is pretty stupid. As the saying goes, there's a lot more bricks at the bottom of the pyramid than there are at the top. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that's what it, it, our edu- education system and other, other related things, I'm not going to go there on all this, but, you know, I have my thoughts about it and observations. And I try not to, you know, people ask me, why do you read so much? I said, because I don't want to be as stupid as you are, you know? <laughs> Well, leaders are readers, right? That's that's the phrase I have yeah, heard a lot. Well, you know, it's possible to learn if you care about it. If you want to, I mean, you can, you know. Mm-hmm. But I mean, the thing about there's a lot more injuries, I think, because kids are are trying to do things. I mean, there's when I was a kid, there was, we didn't even have a television set in our house. You know, now it's everything's YouTube. There's all this stuff that's there. You can go to type in Maynard Ferguson and get, you know sweaty and everything else you want to get watching this guy play high notes but see if you if you take that away and and why wouldn't you listen to kenny dorham or chet baker instead you, you know and like learn to play music instead of like piss off your neighbors with high notes you know <laughs> like, or some dog down know, the street that, well i think that's part of the whole thing that this competition that for years when i was doing clinics i refused to do any festival that was competitive Oh, you know, okay. 
you take if you take 25 bands and bring them in there and you give one guy the best band you send 24 bands home thinking either that they're no good or that the judges are are stupid you know mm -hmm. and you send the majority of the kids home thinking poorly of themselves and one band thinking that they're the god's gift to the planet of music you know and neither of which is correct but you have to bring kids in and let them hear each other and not compete give everybody the same award the same t-shirt the same whatever i just got contacted by some lady in la who's uh they're putting together some sort of a, a com trumpet competition i said no 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 and they, the the judges are wayne bergeron arturo sandoval and uh geofrey you know which is like oh my god you know this is like wait a minute when you when you have judges like you know wayne is one of my students and one of my dear friends and i trust him a hundred percent you know and things like that he's not going to make stupid decisions but when you start judging bands by how flamboyant and things they are rather than how musical mm -hmm. you know you're, you're picking the right you know you, you're picking the guy because he's two inches taller not because he's smarter or better right. at the skill, you know. So something like that, I, I refused to do it uh, for a lot of years, and I finally got to where I I would go back and do them, but I wouldn't judge as long as I had didn't have to be one of the guys to to make critiques of right. players, you know. Well, and then and I, when I when I would do a clinic, I'd always bring up those points about you guys got to quit competing and just start learning to play music and fill your heart with love for music and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that's, that's the healthy way of, I mean, that's how you keep yourself out of trouble anyways, is, is when it becomes about the music and that, that soul connection. Um, and that holds you, an awful lot of the, inj the injuries that people get. It, it prevents get those them too. Yeah. Exactly. They, uh, they honor their, their, their bodies and what, what their bodies screaming at them to stop doing or to start doing. Um, and that's, that's honestly like a big thing that I've learned is, is um, I mean, we always talk about like, you're not competing with others. You only competing with who you were yesterday or something like that. And there's that, yeah. that growth mindset. That's I think really beneficial, but it's also, there's also can be um, a detriment to that. Of what I found is like, if you are too competitive with who you were yesterday, that can also lead to, you know, to the injury um, or to pushing yourself mentally or physically more than, you know, than what you're, what you should be doing. So. I agree. Well, I think I wanted to show you, this is the last page of my study guide book. The pursuit of excellence is gratifying and healthy. That means co just constant improvement moving right. forward. Okay. The pursuit of perfection is frustrating, neurotic, and a terrible waste of time, you mm -hmm. know? Perfection cannot exist in a in a universe of atoms and molecules, which are always in motion. Perfection right. stops everything. Mm -hmm. So, don't ever try to be perfect. It can't exist. You'll drive yourself into an insane asylum if you try to do that. You will mm -hmm. lose, lose, lose. You're booby trapping your whole life to try to be perfect. Just try to enjoy what you're doing and try to get move forward and learn something new. Don't compete with the guy sitting next to you. Pat him on the back and and ask him, yeah, show me something, you know, or, you mm -hmm. know, ask questions and, like, learn. But all the rest of it's a waste of time in life, you know. I mean, it's mm -hmm. totally stupid, you know. And, and I, I sit back and see it, and I, I sometimes, like, go, oh, my gosh, how are we going to fix all of this, you know. But <clears throat> And I'm not going to be able to fix it all, but... <clears throat> I can only do my own little part, you know? Yeah. And I've affected an awful lot of, thankfully I've affected an awful lot of band directors who used to be very competitive and they stopped doing that because of my sitting down with them over a couple of beers and saying, look, you need to learn something here. Let's talk about this, you know? And if they can, a lot of them have just pulled down all the trophies in their band room and all the flags and, and, and banners off the walls and started to put up pictures of John Coltrane or Miles Davis or or a classical player or somebody, yeah. you know, or not just trumpet players, but talk about music instead of like com competition and stuff like that, you know. 
And, yeah. you know, these kids that sit in the band room and all they see is shelves full of, of uh, marching band trophies and stuff like that. Trophies and stuff. It intimidates them, you know? Yeah. It's, and then it'll push them. It'll cause them to push themselves farther than they, they can go. Yeah. And I think, yeah. you know, that, that quote, I think it really also can apply a lot to, um, you know, our, our friends who are, who are going or who are in the thick of their injury recovery themselves is uh, right, right now. Right. Um, you know, sometimes we try to rush our recovery or try to put a timeline on it or that perfect, I guess, however perfect we can make our, um, timeline to, to coming back or when we want to come back. But I guess excellence in that sense would just be, you know, just trusting that, trusting the process, I guess. And, um, and just striving to, you know, keep learning during that time of not being able to play. And, um, that could be like your. I guess sense of excellence um, well, as you're going through. There's it. one. There's one little thing that you. I think we can add to this whole thing, and it's the little, the age-old, little mini philosopher that I try to be sometimes. You know, but there's a thing that I wrote many years ago that uh, said all the years of playing and teaching, I've discovered there's two things you can do with music. You can either impress people or you can touch people. So when you put the horn up to your face, think about what your intention is. Now, I mm -hmm. sent that to these people in L.A. that are doing this competition, and the lady came back to me. She said, can we use that quote on the T-shirts? And I said, well, it's a little long to trim. I edited it down, but I, wa I want people to know that there's two things you can do with music. You can impress people or touch people. Think about what your intention is. That's all that we're going to do. You know, and if you think like, do you need a pat on the back? Do you need people to applaud? Do you need them to like you? Mm -hmm. That's that's a psychological weakness on the part of the of the person. You know, yeah. people who have to go out there and and you know show off. Like Arturo is the worst case of that in the world. You know, he's, he's he has skills on the trumpet that very few people have. He's ridiculous skilled, but he uses them like for the wrong reason you know he's always like trying to compete and show you he's better than you and stuff like that and play higher than you and all that and then faster than you and he plays a solo and he's like it's eight million notes per measure you know and i mean we don't get paid by the note you know so i mean <laughs> yeah i think I mean, uh, yeah i don't think that's what music's all about you know he's been trying to get me on the bandstand to compete with him for decades but i won't do it you know Nice. Um, I speak enough Spanish. I speak enough Spanish to cuss him out too. You know. So. <laughs> oh man, that would be an interesting conversation. I think people would pay money. No, 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 no. Let's leave that alone. <laughs> um. So, I think uh, I want. I want to stay on this this edu this ed you know education business for a second because I um when we were talking before, uh, you talked about some resources that you're developing. Um with uh, uh uh the kelly mouthpiece company right um oh, yeah. to help to help with um you know educators have more resources to help put their tr young trumpet players on uh on a better path i think this is really good um so so listen up everybody well the most of the years that i well 69 years that i've been so-called teaching which means trying to help people but not knowing what I was doing in the early days you know but uh, I've noticed that the majority of the amateur problems and the injuries and things like that as I did mention a little bit earlier they come from playing on a wrong mouthpiece starting on one and developing bad habits trying to compensate for the velocity drop as your airstream goes into a mouthpiece that's too big too deep too too small or too wide or something that forces you to start compensating. The two compensations are always like pinch the aperture tighter together, press the mouthpiece in tighter and force, try to force, and then force air and try to overblow and things of that sort, you know. And so uh, I've known about this for decades, but I just, I just had it on the back shelf in my mind and I, I just would sit around and say, it's too bad, it's too bad, it's too bad. And finally, uh, one of my students who drives here from Texas every month or so for a 
for a lesson. He drives four hours here, takes a two hour, three hour lesson, and then drives back. You know, I mean, it's what exertion. That's pretty exertion, you know. I mean, I mean, it's like pretty. It's a sign of commitment, you know. But he's a he directs. He teaches. He and his wife teach little kids, beginners. So he asked me in a lesson, "What mouthpiece would you start a beginner on?" And I went, "Ah, oh, <laughs> no, those are one hundred and twenty-five dollars or up. You know, you don't. No parents should have to pay that kind of money." So. Uh, after he left, I thought, you know, I had told him, I said, well, it just isn't one that's not afford that's affordable. So I thought about this a little, and and I had this light bulb going off over my head, and I thought about it a lot for days and days and days. <laughs> and I thought, I wonder if I could get somebody to make a beginner's mouthpiece, Yamaha. I'm with Yamaha, but you know, their mouthpieces are 80 bucks and up, you know, so they're not interested in that. They might be later, but right now, the Kelly mouthpieces, these uh, these things in acrylic and all different colors and all that stuff are great because they're plastic. A kid can drop them. It doesn't dent. Uh, they let, they're light. They put it in their pocket. They can carry it and buzz on it, you know, and if you lose it, it's 25 bucks, you know nothing so anyway uh i contacted jim kelly and i thought about this and we're going to make two mouthpieces there's going to be a wide one and a narrow one uh and the, the narrow one is going to be narrower than a 7c and the wider one is going to be wider than a 7c people who have thick very thick lips need a wider mouthpiece inside diameter and so people who have thin Lips need a narrower one. A 7C is just not right. It's in the middle, but it's not where if you start somebody on a, on a narrower inside, he's going to get better reaction and response. People who play the wider one need it because of the thickness of, of their lips, you know? Right. So right. that's all. So we're going to make two, and we're not going to put a bowl shaped cup on it. We're going to put an M cup, one in the middle which is a quicker response. We're going to move the throat closer to the guy's lips so he responds easier, doesn't have to press the pinch and all that. We can eliminate a lot of the pinch, press, and pray from using your mouthpieces like this. And so we're going to make the same size cup for cornet and trumpet, you know, just different shank. Then right. for trombone, we're going to make two sizes. We're going to make one, like most trombone players end up on a, like a six which is like a classical mouthpiece. It's good for some classical guys and all that, but it's horrible to start on it because it's like, my God, you know, it's it, it's huge. And so we're going to, the smaller one is going to be, the, the larger one is going to be <clears throat> equivalent to a Bach 12, which is closer to like a big band lead player's mouthpiece, you know, kind of. And that's going to be the wider one. And the smaller one is going to be a 22 Bach inside diameter, which is very narrow, you know? So a little kid 10 years old doesn't have to have this big thing fit on his face like that. And then we're gonna make the same thing for tubas too. You know, wow. they're gonna be a wide one and a narrow one. So we're gonna get cornet, trumpet, trombone, and tuba in two mouthpieces only for a, a, a W for wide, an N for narrow, you know? And that's what they'll be. And it, it'll be just a beginner's mouthpiece. And if they, it isn't that we want them to stay on it, but they might. But the point being, if, they, if we get started on it, there's less of a likelihood that they're going to set up all of the problems of pinching and pressing the mouthpiece in there, which create bad habits, which create uh, bad embouchure problems, and which create injuries eventually, possibly. Mm -hmm. you know, so, yeah, College I think it's down the road, yeah. So Jim Kelly is, I sent him all the configurations and the cups and the whatever, and the mouthpieces. So he is on his own. I told him, don't rush, just do it when it's convenient for you. But he's making the prototypes for it. And I just got my cornet back from a loan so I can 
test the mouthpieces when they come here, you know. I don't have a tuba here, but I have trombones and cornets and trumpets. So I can do all, I can do three of the four. Cool. So anyway, that's basically that. And I don't know when they'll be done, but it's up to you. And I don't know when they'll be on the market. That's up to all of us. And once we get them tested and confirmed, mm-hmm. but there's, there are a lot of people hearing about this and that are very interested in getting you know, the guy that brought the whole thing up from Texas initially, he said he wants to order 25 of them immediately, of each one when he gets them in. That's like, you know, 100 mouthpieces, you know. So, yeah. No, and, and that's why I wanted to bring it up on this show, because this will be coming out in January of, of 2024. Um, and so uh, I, I just really wanted to have this out there as soon as, as possible. Well, relatively speaking so that um, educators could hear about it and then be ready for it. Um, because I, you know, I, I'd be willing to, to put money on a lot of injuries um, not only being uh, caused by bad technique, but also be, like you said, by being started by just starting on the wrong equipment, um, which, which causes, I mean, that's what we always talk about injuries being caused by poor technique, but, you know, we could go a step further and probably dial it back to, you know, start like those, that poor technique being caused by, by the wrong equipment, you know? Well, one of the other thing I want to add to this whole thing about bad information is that fluttering is a re- replenishing of the blood supply in the facial muscles. And people might, most people don't flutter to warm up. They might do a little bit, but most people flutter when they're in trouble. When they feel like, oh, my God, what's happening? And they'll go, you know, mm-hmm. and try to do it. But it's a little late then, you know. Once you've got a flat tire, it's time to pull over, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I've been trying to encourage and tell people, all students, at every level, it's free. You can do as much as you want. Can you do too much of it? Yeah. I mean, can you drink too much water? Yes. It'll kill you if you drink too much water, you know. Right. But the point about it is, when you're practicing, you sit on you, you get a good warm up, and then you play a little, and then stop and flutter, rest, you know. Because when you're on a gig, you're not playing twenty four straight. Maybe in a rodeo once in a while, you know, but in, in a circus. But you don't play all the time. You have saxophone solo, piano solo. <clears throat> so when you're practicing, play, rest, flutter, play, rest, and flutter do that and it adds to the condition of your facial muscles it replenishes the blood supply means it adds to your endurance the period of time that you can stop and continue playing so those kind of things are are helpful just to be able to stop and flutter and that keeps because once you run out of blood you start you know your corners are aching and everything else it's you're on the downs down slope at that point, you know, and you're in trouble. Mm-hmm. So that's that can add to the, a lot of the problems. I think just being smart enough to flutter sensibly periodically is going to help a great deal in itself, you know. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing about in the fundamentals that I teach, you know, isometric lip buzzing, you know, just. <laughs> You know, sitting, buzzing. I did it on a bicycle when I was 10 years old. I rode all over the neighborhood buzzing nursery rhymes and, and you know, Christmas songs or whatever, you know. And I was developing without realizing. I was in the gym doing weightlifting, you know. I was doing isometrics. Mm-hmm. And everybody said, why is he buzzing so much, you know. And none, nobody was really buzzing. But I was buzzing every day. And I was first chair immediately. Nobody else was, you know, and everybody thought, well, Bobby must have been a past past life trumpet player because how could he learn to play so (laughs) well so so soon? Well, it was because I was doing the right things, you know, Mm -hmm. nobody else was buzzing. People say, oh, don't do that buzzing. That's silly. No, no, it's not silly if you do it right. It's silly if you do it wrong. Yeah, yeah, it's the whole too much water thing. I teach the right way to do it. I teach the right way to do it, period, Mm -hmm. you know. So... Anyway, that's basically it. I mean, I hate to see people get injured playing an instrument, you know, but it happens on trombones and all that. And one other thing just to add to this whole thing about 
the illnesses that go. It's more of an illness rather than a, a choppy problem, but people don't keep their instruments clean. You know, uh, that's true. And I've seen people that that a kid would, I, one kid in a clinic. I said, "Look," he was saying, "My horn just feels terrible." I said, "Let me see it," and I looked at it and I went, "Good God, what is wrong?" I pulled the tuning slide out and I looked down the leader pipe, and and it was filthy. There was I could see lumps of shit in the leader <laughs> pipe. I went, "Good God!" I said, "When did? When's the last time you washed this horn out?" He said, "Oh, I've never washed it out." Oh my God! How long have you been playing? He said, four years." I went, "Holy God!" I mean, I don't want to see your underwear, for a kid. You know, <laughs> you know. But I mean, people don't clean them. One of my uh, students is a lady. She's retired now. She was a biochemist and taught at a, a Cal State. Uh, where was it? San Bernardino, in California. And she's a biochemist, and she designed a thing called blow uh blow dry i think it's called and it's a thing where you take uh these things like spitballs mm -hmm. they're foam things spitballs are made out of foam and you mm -hmm. sat soak them in an isopropyl alcohol and then you stick one into the leader pipe and you push it down into the leader pipe a little bit and then you you push all the valves down and you blow through the leader pipe with all three valves down and that that alcohol saturated uh, uh, spitball goes through every tubing in the horn and comes out the bell. And what it does oh, wow. is it kills, back, kills bacteria in the horn. And people, there was a trombone player in New York that got so much bacteria in his trombone and he got sick and he almost died. He was in the hospital for two weeks trying to keep him alive just because of the back, when you blow air, you get a backlash on it. And it was getting into his saliva, all of the bacterial infections and wow. stuff. And I just, you know, you don't have to wash your horn out every day, but it doesn't hurt to to put it in the bathtub and run water through the bell and wiggle the valves and just and then blow it out right. two or three times once a week, and then put put one and then put a few drops of oil down the leader pipe and blow it all the way through, wiggling your valves and saturate the inside of the horn with valve oil. That lubricates your airstream. Mm -hmm. And it also kind of <laughs> helps keep the bugs down a little bit, you know, a little yeah. bit. But, keeps the but see, that, that too, that's a, that's the thing that causes a lot of people problems is they, their horn does not clean so it doesn't play well. They start trying to force it. And it's all it's got is a bunch of like, you look, crap comes out of those horns that looks like the snails are living in there, for God's sake, you know? Yeah, that's something I, I mean, actually, yeah, that's something I, I've never considered as, a, as could be a cause of, I guess, overcompensation, uh, could, which could lead to injury. That's that's really interesting. And it makes sense, total sense. I have my own share of stories of when I was younger, um, when he, when uh, I was less dutiful in cleaning my instrument that we don't need to get into, but anyway um well bobby thank you so much for your time today um I, I think what we've talked about has been really beneficial for a lot of people for everyone all of all of the listeners out there in podcast land or whatever you want to call it um i just want to close and just ask you a few last few questions um just uh, you know pedagogical stuff aside um you know for the for the um the musicians out there who are in the thick of you know, their injury or just got hurt, you know, not going to be able to play for a little bit. Like what's the most, what's the one thing that you would tell them? Well, <clears throat> if they're playing and it's hurts, don't play, take, take some time off, get a washcloth, soak it in hot water, wring it out and lay it across your face horizontally and, and just let that open up the pores and, that relaxes like where the nerves are, are being pinched by tensed muscles. So that loosens everything up like this instead of like that. All right. And then when it's then put the washcloth back in the sink and let it soak more hot water. And while it's there, <coughs> do cheek fluttering with one cheek at a time and flap them. Don't tighten up in the corners and, and get blood. Fat, fat. Blood is the body's natural healer. It, 
if you are living, if you're not eating everything served through a window, you're going to be <laughs> somewhat healthy, you know. Mm -hmm. If you're getting plenty of sensible food, fruits and vegetables, and not loading yourself up with a bunch of greasy burgers and crap like that, you know. Mm -hmm. If you if you have any kind of nutrition in your body, that blood will help heal your body up, you know. So that's the starting point. The washcloth is a good thing. It can be done a couple of times a day if you want, if you're in real trouble. Fluttering can be done, you know, not excessively, but keep doing it. Then <clears throat> you need to stop and assess how you're breathing. And if you're breathing from, if you're just, if you're not lifting your shoulders and filling up like, and even supporting from the abdominal area around the belly button, around the navel. If you don't support from down there, you're doing everything from your face, which is where a lot of the problems stem from because they're not, it's not a whole body kind of, you know, what the yoga power breath mm -hmm. does for you is, is it distributes the workload where it needs to be. So you're not playing from your face only. That's it's like lifting a, a dumbbell stuff. with your finger. Yeah. You're like, you know, you're doing everything from your face. That Your face can't do it all. Mm -hmm. You know, it cannot. It can't breathe, vibrate, support, and everything else. It's like, come on, you know. So, <clears throat> and then the last thing you got to do is is make sure that you're not pinching and, and interrupting the aperture and its ability to let air pass through it and create sound. And then the fourth thing is, Think about what mouthpiece you're playing on. If you're playing on a one and a half C and you're trying to be a lead player, it's the banana at home plate again, you know, mm -hmm. and it ain't going to work. And so those kind of things, fundamentals are the beginning of solutions. But you got to, if you're really hurting yourself, you know, get off, take off, put the thing down for it and like and heal up. Send a sub in there, you know, or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, I've, seen where guys would move down in the section and say, hey, get over here and play the lead book. I I need to get a break here. And they'd move down to a third or fourth chair and and, and salvage the, the effort level for a while until they recovered, you know, just so they didn't lose the income to feed the kids and so forth, you know. Yeah, that that is true. That's that, uh, <clears throat> it's an aspect that uh, I guess people in my position as students – um uh, may not consider is that some people they uh they don't have the luxury of of just taking off when they need to um yeah but well, uh, I but i mean Economic. you got to do what you got to do you got to do what you got to yeah. do to get healthy that's that's i think the number one thing is uh you know money aside even um you got to do what you got to do to get healthy um well money money can't be the i i understand how we live i understand how the planet is designed it's not thought out very well, but it's too much. You know, money is the root of all evil. And boy, I can tell you that is pretty much true what's going on. Just look at the Senate and Congress mm -hmm. and what's going on with these people. You know, I mean, all the most politicians are, are ambitious and greedy about power and money. That's They don't. The word politician starts with an old Greek word, P-O-L, which means for the people. Okay. Yeah politician is supposed to be for the people the word police is supposed to be p-o-l for the people how about the word polite it's still p-o-l oh, there you go yeah it's still means, I like that. still means, you know the right thing that's, awesome. that's yeah, why yeah. i got all those dictionaries over there you see and, <laughs> and, and i'm interested in language and why you know and when people are a politician and they're not doing their job i'm going uh uh, it's not very polite. There's a there's a, a great saying. I wish I had it verbatim. I can't recite it, but Mark Twain had a great thing he said about politicians. It, it was to somewhere to the degree these are a bunch of silly, silly idiots that get together and and just argue back and forth and never get anything done for their entire careers. You know, and that's mm -hmm. pretty close to what happens right now. It's just you see all these guys that are in there. The, oh God, it's it's like. I know a lot of people who have gotten into politics, friends I went to school with and all that. And I think like, you know, God, they used to be a nice kid, but there was always something I didn't trust about them. I you know. know. <laughs> it, 
Well, anyway, look, I hope, I hope this project turns out to be beneficial for you and for somebody. I'm honored that you uh, included me in the, the list of people to contact. I will, you know, you got uh, a contact from uh, from Craig Kenny, right? You have yes, his email. I'll be reaching out to him today. Yeah, I will be reaching okay. out to him today. And I'll send you. I'll send you Raul's uh, uh, email, and he said he's willing. He's the guy that got hit with the skateboard, you know. Mm -hmm. So you oh, can man, talk to him about what he's doing. And if I can, I, I can think of the other ones. I, as I will, I'll send them to you. You know, there's a lot of, of really good people out there. I just can't remember all their names. I, there's mm -hmm. several of them right in the front of my head. I just can't come up with a name for them. You know. And I can't, well, I can't no, project the vision on the screen for you, you know, so. It's all good. We'll, uh, we'll no, do I, the best. The, the reason why we're doing this is to get more and, more and more people talking about injury and more and more people aware of it and people being aware of who's a resource and who's not, you know. Um, well, I, I wish I could put Doc Severinsen on you, but he would shit if I gave you his, <laughs> his information, you know. He's a very <laughs> private guy. When when he's not on stage, like impressing people, he's very private, you know. Understandably so. so. All right. All well, right, well, for everyone in podcast land, thank you for listening, and uh, we'll see you at the next show. And check out Bobby if uh, if you want to take a lesson and uh, work with him and recovering from your injury. He's a definitely a, a great resource. It's uh, okay to come to me if you're feeling good too. Actually, you know? yeah, that's also true. I, yeah, he's not only about the, the, the trumpet doctor. <laughs> Oh, no, we'll talk about Chet Baker and Kenny Dorham. Okay. Right. Yeah, please. All hey, right. Good luck. Have Come. a good one. You too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Thanks for listening into our conversation today. I hope you got as much out of it as I did. To see a full bio for our guest today, see the show notes or go to our website at trusttheprocesspodcast.com. Make sure you share this with a musician you care about who's going through injury or a music educator in your life, or anyone just trying to make it in life. If you have a suggestion for a guest or topic to cover, shoot me an email at trustprocesspodcast at gmail.com or send me a message on Facebook or Instagram. Before we go, I just want to give a heartfelt thank you and shout out to my team, Daniel Baldwin, who is my audio engineer, Kevin West, who does all music and sound effects for the show, and my sister Dana Lovell, who created the logo and promotional materials. We wouldn't have this show without them. So tune in next time for another episode of Trust the Process.